On today's Locked On Cavs, let's dive into the history of the Cleveland Rockers and the WNBA. Let's dive in. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. I'm Chris Manning. You know me. No Jake Stevens, our producer. Evan's off today, but we have a special guest, Vince Guerreri, writes at Cleveland Magazine, who has a book out called Weird Moments in Cleveland Sports. You can go get it right now. Perhaps would make a good holiday gift for the Cleveland sports nut in your life. But we're going to talk about a story Vince wrote for Cleveland Magazine about the Cleveland Rockers, about the guns, about LeBron James, about the WNBA. We're going to talk about that today, all on today's show. I want to tell you, too, that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 Moneyline bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get started. Vince, thank you so much for coming on. How are you doing today? Good, good. Uh, Spent the day at the uh, Cleveland Public Library downtown doing research on uh, my next story. I'm very excited to read that next story. That is also one of, as a, I'm a downtown resident myself, that is one of my favorite work from home places is that library. Underrated work, work, underrated going to the library just to get some work done, I think. It really is. All right, let's talk about the story. So you wrote a story for Cleveland Magazine. Uh, our friend, my friend, your friend, everyone, should be everyone's friend, Dylan Stewart, the editor of Cleveland Magazine connected us on this and i'm really glad i did it because when i read this story vince this is one of those stories that i was just really excited to read because i find i have a deep fascination with the rockers i have a deep i was not alive fully for their full run i don't don't totally remember them but this is one of to to me such an interesting story in the history of cleveland sports so but before we get into some of the specifics why did this story why did this team why did this appeal to you why was this something you wanted to do Well, I have a fascination for, uh, I was a history major, so I have a fascination for things that aren't there anymore uh, or are there in some other uh, certain form. Uh, I like going to the Baseball Heritage Museum at League Park. It is kind of my happy place to go and and visit. Uh, So I I have a certain fascination with um, things that that aren't there anymore. I, I wrote about the Cleveland Barons, which was Cleveland's uh, ill-fated NHL team for a couple of years in the 70s. Uh, I wrote about the early years of the NBA. Uh, well, I should say the NBA's uh, forerunner, um, which included the uh, Cleveland Rebels, who played for one year at the old Cleveland Arena. Um, obviously, uh, there was a, a team uh, owned by George Steinbrenner, the Cleveland Pipers, that played at uh, wherever they could get a crowd uh, in the 60s. But I, I've just kind of been fascinated by all of these teams that came and went in Cleveland sports history. And I thought the Rockers were really interesting because I do remember the Rockers. I was summer help uh, when I was in college at the Tribune Chronicle in Warren, and we actually covered the Rockers at the time. Um, So, you know, that was one of those things that we had a reporter that would would go up a couple of times a week and and write about the the Rockers. It was was actually not a a very long season. Um, They made it a point to schedule within – uh, the NBA off season, mm-hmm. um, just so it wouldn't go up against the NBA or or college basketball. Um, so you know, we I do remember it, and I was kind of fascinated by uh, by the team. And then you know, one day it wasn't there. And and obviously, in the last ten years or so, uh, women's sports, women's basketball in particular, has really kind of taken on a life of its own. I mean, it's it's you know, I I think everybody was kind of uh, enwrapped in the NCAA tournament um, last year, men's and women's. Uh, and I think that, you know, everybody is, has become fascinated by Caitlin Clark at uh, Iowa. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I feel like there is a, a more prominent space for um, women's sports now. And, and I feel like it was an accident of timing that the Rockers kind of uh, faded away when they did. So, reading this story and thinking about it and, and you look back on it, why did they ultimately leave based on your reporting, based on what people told you based on what we knew at the time, was it like as simple as the guns needed money that they wanted to sell the team and they thought this was a badass? Like why ultimately did this team 
just make the finals, make a playoff run one year, have some success, and then just vanish over the course of one summer? Well, uh, you know, it. They were the short answer is they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, the the team started in 1997. Um, they started uh, all the the teams in the WNBA were owned by the NBA. Um, and then in 2002, ownership transferred to the teams in the respective cities. Every WNBA team was in an NBA city at that point. Uh, and in fact, I believe that's still a case. And uh, ownership transferred to the local NBA team. And, you know, one of the things that, that a lot of the, the people connected to the Rockers told me is that, you know, I think the staff was was kind of burnt out as well because they didn't really have an off season because um, the the WNBA teams relied on the office staff and the, you know, ticket sales staff and things like that. Uh, the same team that the NBA team did. So, I mean, you had these people who were working uh, essentially year round now with, you know, not a, as much of a break as they might have had beforehand. Um, obviously, it, it looked like the guns were um, poised to sell the team. They had bought the team in the in the 1980s. I'm not sure how much of an interest they had in basketball. Um, they were actually minority owners of uh, the Cleveland Barons NHL team, and then after that team folded, they were minority owners in the San Jose Sharks. Uh, so, you know, uh, but it was one of those instances where um, I, I feel like there was a sense of civic responsibility to buy this team after Ted Stepien had driven it into the ground. Um, so they they had the team, they had had the team at that point for about 20 years. And I don't know how many people knew it at the time, but it, it really looks like in retrospect, they were getting ready to sell the Cavs. And there was no sense of whether or not um, the the Rockers would be an asset or a liability if they were uh, if they were going to sell the Cavs. As it turns out, they sold the Cavs uh, of course, to Dan Gilbert, uh, who's the living embodiment of that line and diamonds are forever that somewhere he's playing Monopoly with real buildings. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel like had they held on, um, you know, ha had they, they marketed both teams, I think Gilbert would have would have bought them both in an instant, especially now that the Cavs had turned into uh, a money making machine, thanks to LeBron James. The last thing I'll ask before we go into our, our first break here, Vince, is, is about LeBron. So he comes into the league the year that they go. He is at a game at one point. This is in the story. out. The people can find this in the show notes. Go read it. Uh, I have my print copy that I, I read and then noted up. Go subscribe to Cleveland Magazine. When you think about the LeBron juxtaposition of this and the fact that he comes in when they leave, and obviously this is 20 years ago. It's a different time, all of that. But did, how did when you were reporting on this, what did the players, the people you talked to, what did they have to say about the LeBron component of this, where the, the, this guy's coming in, but they're getting kind of shoved out the back door a little bit? There were people who were a lot more diplomatic about it who said, you know, it looked like the, uh, the guns were focusing more on the Cavaliers and less on the Rockers. And uh, honestly, attendance was in decline. Um, so, uh, there, there were definitely financial reasons that the, the rockers might not be a great investment, but, uh, there were a lot of players who said, yeah, they got LeBron. Oh, one of them flat out told me if they had not gotten this once in a generational talent, I really believe that, uh, the rockers would still be playing. It's one of, it's a what if to me, it, it is fascinating. And also just, I, the timing of it with Dan Gilbert and and we'll talk in later in the show, like if we think this would be a good market once again for the WNBA at some point, Dan Gilbert maybe holding on to it to some degree is is a what if to me. I don't know if he's ever been asked about that, and you know he's not he doesn't do much media anymore considering his health and whatnot. But that it's such a what if to me if that had been part of the sale and it lists last year's like is that something he holds on to? Is that something that persists in the city to this day? If the timing is just a little bit different. All right, after this break though. Let's talk about the Rockers at the time. When they left, what was the energy for the team in the city? What worked, what didn't? And, and some interesting quotes Vince got in the story about what players seem to say about being in the city. We'll talk about that up next. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the official sportsbook of Locked On. As the weather gets colder, stay hot on FanDuel. 
Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That is $150 if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is really easy to use. They have spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. They have Cavs Celtics odds if you're looking for that this Thursday. So right now, visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn, continue the NBA season, kick off the NFL season, and take advantage of our offer where new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL and the official sportsbook of LockedOn. Vince, the Rockets culture at the time, when you think about what they were in the city, what kind of place did they have in, in the city at the time before they went away? Well, it's it was a, a really a very interesting uh, time to be a sports team in Cleveland, for, for lack of a better way to put it. Because you have to remember, when they came into the uh, when they came into the league, when, when the league was started, um, they were playing in a brand new arena. Uh, the Cavs were were kind of decent, but not spectacular to 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 be diplomatic about it. Um, the Indians obviously were in the middle of, of you know, a renaissance for uh, baseball in Cleveland, and the Browns were uh, on hiatus, or as I like to call it, the three years they went undefeated. Um, <laughs> so they really land, uh, they really land in Cleveland in a really interesting time. Uh, and like I said, you know, women's sports was kind of having a moment. This all um, kind of coalesced because of uh, the women's dream team in the 1996 Olympics. Uh, they went on a, a an international tour uh, leading up to the Olympics. Um, they 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 kicked ass in the Olympics, and and they said, hey, maybe there's a a market for some kind of professional women's basketball. So um, you know, since I want to say about the early to mid '80s, there have been all kinds of people just waiting to write this this wonderful story about Cleveland's comeback, and and the mid '90s was was probably a really good. Uh, example of one of those moments where there was a lot of fodder to do that. Uh, Gateway had just opened. The Rock Hall had just opened. Um, the Indians were were um, who had been losers for the previous 35 years. Now all of a sudden were one of the best teams in Major League Baseball. So um, you know, and there was still uh, there was a lot going on. Uh, the Flats were what they were were still what they were when they were uh, redeveloped, and and a lot of the players talked about that. Uh, they said they all lived in in Reserve Square, uh, right there by uh, Masthead now, uh, mm-hmm. and they they all spent some time uh, down in the flats in their in their off hours. This this is such an interesting Vince. I think to me the 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 the, the what they must have been feeling at the time too. And I don't know if this transition to the fans as much. It's sometimes hard, I think, for some of the business parts of sports to do that. Just in a world where. They, the players and the organizations often know more in real time than the players do. But you talk about how they felt this is hanging over them and that they felt like they maybe needed to win to stay and all of this stuff. When, when you're talking to them, they look back on that. What was it like talking to them as they're really kind of grappling, like kind of looking back and just wondering how much, um, how, how odd it was that this was their reality to some degree? Well, and, and that's that's a really good point. Um, like I said, in 2002, uh, the what turned out to be the next to last season for the Rockers, uh, team uh, league ownership was uh, transferred to uh, the respective teams. Uh, and, you know, some of those teams and, and two WNBA teams folded and two additional ones uh, relocated. Uh, so there was definitely a sense that <clears throat> Excuse me. There was definitely a sense that their um, uh, that their future was a little tenuous, uh, but it it sounded like they kind of tried to uh, uh, keep it uh, uh, as tight under wraps as they could. Although it, it sounds like a lot of the players uh, had a sense that uh, something untoward might be going on. Uh, I remember Dan Hughes said, "Yeah, they told me as long as uh, uh, as long as the team was here, I had a job with them." And, uh, it took me a minute to realize what they meant by that. That was one of the, the standout quotes. Because you have Dan Hughes, who's an Ohio native, a Cleveland area native. And he is, like, is kind of like, oh, like later I would realize that he goes on to have a whole career, a whole really great run with the Seattle Storm. He's uh, a legend in the coaching game. And so many of the people, Vince, you talked to for this story, 
are still involved in the game in some way. Val Ackerman, you know, who you talked to in the story, was the inaugural president. She's the commissioner of the Big East now. Um, Amanda Petrick, who was doing PR for the team, works at Key Bank. Um, Chastity Melvin, who I've actually talked to her. She's, she was really cool to talk to about the Rockers. She coaches in North Carolina now. She does some announcing work for the Mystics and has been very much in the game for a long time. It's like the 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 tentacles of the Rockers are still there, which is interesting considering it's been 20 years and you, sometimes you think that might die out, but the tentacles beyond even the people you talk to are still very much there, which is really interesting to me that that, that has kind of persisted in a way, even though like the, the team itself and, and the connections to the modern WNBA, you don't really think about them as much as you might, as, as you might think considering all the people that are still left. You know, I've been thinking about this for, for a, actually a very different reason. Um, mm. You know, there are certain, I, I had to go, uh, I went to Bowling Green. I had to go back to Bowling Green recently for, uh, for a funeral. And, and I realized kind of that the, um, the, the people that you meet when you are at that formative uh, period of your young adulthood, be it college, be it your early to mid twenties uh, and the experiences you had, which may or may not have been positive at the time, uh, are turn out to be very formative, and the people that you went through them with, um, you you turn out to bond with more than you might have expected. What the last thing I'll ask about the 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 culture at the time is to compare it to now. How do you look back at how women's basketball was looked at, looked at, talked about in that time? And how and how it compares to now when it is in this boom era, and obviously Caitlin Clark and and the whole college game and the W now is so much bigger. But how does it compare to how it was talked about, written about, rooted for by fans in the city then? Well, I think that um, what you have seen is uh, since then there has been a fragmentation of media. Uh, I mean, you know, the only people, like I said, I was in Warren at the time, and uh, and we covered the team. Um, I know that, you know, we had uh, the, the usual suspects in Northeast Ohio, uh, the TV stations in Cleveland, the Plain Dealer, uh, maybe some other outlying newspapers covered the uh, WNBA, but that was uh, pretty much about it. Uh, now, whatever you want to know about the NBA, you can find somewhere. Whatever you want to know about the WNBA, you can find somewhere. And there are people who are uh, far more dedicated to covering the WNBA, uh, maybe not necessarily for uh, a local news outlet, but you know it's somebody that you can go and read or watch on TV or watch on your phone, uh, which is another great example of how uh, the media landscape has has changed. Um, I mean, I had a cell phone in 2003. You know what I did with it? I made phone calls with it. Yeah. Now. <laughs> What do you do with your phone? You do just about everything. You can pay your bills. You're on social media. You can check your email. You can, you know, order uh, dinner. You can order groceries. I mean, there's no end to what you can do uh, digitally now. And and I feel like that leads to, um, that makes it easier for a lot of people to find their fandom. So if there are people out there who say, boy, uh, I really want to get into women's sports, I mean, they can go find WNBA highlight. They can go, you know, find, um, you know, wherever a, a women's game is going on somewhere. Coming back after this, let's talk about basketball, women's basketball specifically in Cleveland. Could it come back in some way? The final four is here in the spring. We'll talk about that up after this. Today's episode is brought to you by Dave. Finances can be so intimidating. That's why you need Dave. Dave can make manage your money so much easier with interest-free extra cash advance, free goal tracking, easy ways to find a side hustle to make more money. It's the banking app that is leveling the financial field. When you download Dave, you could get up to $500 in five minutes or less, no credit check and no late fees. It's part of the Dave extra cash account. Advance the money you need with no interest and then settle up later. And you can build credit when you settle up on time. Millions of people have already downloaded Dave to make their finances easier. So if you're in a pinch, get the help you need by downloading Dave. Download Dave today at dave.com dot slash locked in NBA. That's dave.com slash locked in NBA. You get up to five hundred dollars in five minutes or less. No credit check and no late fees. Download the Dave app now or go to dave.com slash locked in NBA. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal eligible to criteria and instant transfer apply. 
banking services provided by Evolve member FDIC. So Vince, I'll just ask this open-ended question to you. Uh, could the Rockers in your mind come back? Would it be a good idea? Could it work? Uh, I, I, I mean, that's uh, that's a really good question. And, and that's kind of one of the things that kind of led me down this road uh, to, to the story was, you know, is there a possibility? Now, I will preface this by saying nobody has made uh, a concerted effort to try and bring uh, an existing WNBA team or an expansion team to Cleveland. So uh, as far as I know, there's nothing going on to make this a reality. Uh, do I think there is a market for it? I absolutely think there is a market for it. Uh, I feel like there is a, a very um, uh, a big interest in basketball in Cleveland. Uh, I feel like there is a big interest in women's sports in Cleveland. And, and I think that there would be uh, there could be enough fans to to support a team in Cleveland. I think two things about this, and I largely agree with it. Number one, I would be curious to see if some of the, the very little chatter I've ever heard about this is that if it's the Dan Gilbert ownership group, they would at the very least look at Columbus as another option just because it's a bigger population. There's the college town there that already has a, a pretty successful women's basketball team there and the college team. I wonder if they might go there. Um, I don't. That to me is a is a whole other debate. If that's the right place, it certainly would be a whole new franchise, a whole new look. But I, I could understand it to some degree. I also, Vince, look ahead to the women's final four that's coming here in the spring, and what the energy is going to be like in the city for that, and particularly if you get some of the big names, whether it's Kaylin Clark, Cameron Brink, Paige Beckers, Angel Reese. You know, the, the, it goes on and on and on. I am very excited to see the biggest stars in the college game right now in the city and see what the city itself is like. Not the people coming in from out of town, which will be cool, but the people that are here, what kind of buy-in does the city get? Um, and and does, that, does that spur something? Does it reveal something about the interest here, uh, which I think would be interesting? Sure, sure. And that's, I mean, I've gone to... Um quite a few uh, men's college basketball games here in Cleveland when the NCAA tournament rolls in. I was there for the regionals in 2015, and it was, uh, I mean, it was a blast. It was undefeated. Kentucky was in town. Uh, Notre Dame gave them all they could handle in that, uh, in that regional final. Uh, it, was, it was a game for the ages, and, and it looked like there was a, a, uh, a good crowd and, you know, a lot of interest and a lot of passion for it. So, um, I feel like there's always a, you know, if you give fans a reason to show up here, they'll show up. Offer not you, valid during baseball season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the baseball part of it would be interesting because you would have some overlap. And certainly they're not going to be in, in <clears throat> town at the same time all the time. But I mean, you could have some really cool days, I would say, even if you're splitting the who's going to buy tickets a little bit of, hey, you have a Guardians game over here. You have a uh, Cleveland WNBA game over here. I think that could be kind of a cool thing. And it would just give this arena that a lot of public money has been spent on, I guess, like a more functional summer use, you know, instead of just sitting there and, and maybe not being used as much as, as is optimal in the summer months. Well, that was actually one of the reasons that the uh, arena was, uh, was built there in the first place. The, the original gateway plans, this was something I had written about for, for Cleveland Magazine uh, a few months ago. Uh, the original uh, gateway plans was for a domed stadium uh, that would accommodate both the Browns and the Indians. Uh, that those plans kind of fell by the wayside once uh, once the Jacobs brothers bought the Indians. But you know they were looking for some kind of indoor venue that they could um, use more year round because obviously uh, they don't do anything with the baseball season or with the baseball stadium when it's out of season. Uh, and they don't do a whole lot with the football stadium when it's out of season. But, you know, they were looking for some kind of uh, reasonably large all-weather venue. Ask you this last question, a little more fun on this. Would you keep the Rockers branding? If, if they said, Vince, you're in charge of picking the name, would you, would you keep the Rockers name? Would you, keep the, I, would you keep the colors? Would you keep the logo? Well, how would you approach that if you were, gonna, you were being consulted on on bringing back the WNBA here and having to decide on, on the, on the branding. Uh, 
You know, it's really funny you bring that up because I can I, I can remember very very specifically saying when the when the Indians changed the Guardians, well, at least they didn't use a guitar somewhere in their logo because it really does seem like you know uh, guitar uh, oriented branding uh, has kind of uh, has kind of been used and and possibly even overused around here. Uh, mm-hmm. But I feel like with the Rockers, there would be a sense of nostalgia. And when they did that, there was still a sense of novelty. I mean, the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame had just opened in 1995 and the Rockers had started playing in 1997. So um, I, I absolutely would stick with it. I would, too. I like the colors. Like, I think you could some of the nostalgia could be really cool. The, the, the G League team here in Cleveland, the Charge, have done their own version of of that jersey and and paid homage to which is very cool but i would just bring it back i there's a there's a real run of 90s nostalgia right now there's a lot of nostalgia in our culture right now i don't under i don't see why you would have to change it i can't i mean i'm not going to tell you i'm the most creative person with team names vince but i can't think of a better one i would prefer that to like the forest or any other cleveland name you could drum up like just just give me the rockers give me the maybe update the guitar in some way Keep the colors, but modernize the uniform and, and let's go. I think you could have a lot of fun with it. Sure. I mean, I went out when I, uh, when I, I went on the book tour, uh, I went out and, and got a tie for every, every sports team. And I, I was looking yeah. for a Cavs tie and I got that, that, that mid nineties, uh, basketball hoop design that they got when they moved into the new arena. And I and mean, I'm, nobody yeah. was nuts about it at the time, but I mean, there are still people who have some kind of warm feeling for it, myself included. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're just ahead of the the curve on that, I think. So, Vince, tell everyone about your book, where they can get it, and what's going on there. Weird Moments in Cleveland Sports uh, came out uh, actually about a year ago through Gray Publishing. You can find it on their website, uh, grayco.com. Uh, it's available also at all the other usual suspects, uh, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, um, Books a Million, uh, wherever fine works of literature are sold. Check out Vince's book. Read his piece at Cleveland Magazine and be on the lookout for the other great work he's going to have coming up soon. That, this has been Locked On Cavs for Thursday, December 14th. Back tomorrow. Evan will be back. We'll do Cavs Celtics recap. We'll talk to you. Thanks again to Jake Stevens, as always, for his work on production. Locked On Cavs.